This is the Focusrite 18i20 in the fourth generation and in this video we're going to find out if it's a worthy successor and how it compares to competing interfaces. Hey Julian Krauss here and with me I got the Focusrite 18i20 fourth gen. I think the Scarlet series from Focusrite is quite well known and does not need any further introduction. It's likely the most sold interface line in the audio interface market. But that makes it even more important to see how the latest generation performs and that's exactly what I'm about to show you. Let's have a look at the hardware first before diving deeper into the audio quality and the software features of the 18i20. Because in my opinion the software plays a big role in how this interface handles. On the front of the 18i20 you get two XLR and TRS inputs for mic and line level devices. More inputs are on the back which we will get to in a second. Then you get a couple of buttons which you can select a channel with and then use the input knob to adjust the gain setting. I think this is a bit slower than having individual knobs for each channel but the gain is also controllable via software which I will show you later. Just one thing I noticed is that the encoder knob currently adjusts the gain in 3db steps. This is a bit too coarse for my taste, I would have preferred like 2 or 1db steps. Luckily you can change the gain in 1db increments in the software, but I would have preferred the knob to do the same. Pretty sure this can be changed with a firmware update, so focus right, you know what to do. There are some additional buttons like the link button, which allows you to link together the gain of multiple channels. This can be super helpful for stereo recording techniques where you want to set the same gain for two or more channels. The 48V button lets you toggle phantom power for each channel individually. The inst button changes the front two inputs to high impedance inputs for instruments. The auto button makes the interface listen to your inputs and then automatically sets the gain for you, which can be handy for setting gain quickly for multiple channels. The save mode is kinda there to prevent clipping, but sadly with a catch and I will go into this a little later. And the air mode makes your audio sound a bit more airy. What exactly that means and sound samples once again later in the video. Besides that you get a couple of level meters which show each analog input and the main outputs. Then you get a button to toggle between two sets of monitor outputs, which can be handy when you use two pairs of monitors. The dim feature just dims the volume of your outputs and the mute button obviously mutes them. The output button lets you toggle the level meters to show your outputs, which can be handy as well. There's also a volume knob, a button for talkback, two headphone outputs with independent volume control and would you believe it, a flippin' power switch. I know I always get overly excited about power switches on audio interfaces, but they are just so handy. Although I think the switch is in the wrong direction. Tell me if I'm wrong in the comments, but up should be on and down should be off, right? So I guess you win some and you lose some. Jumping to the back, you get eight XLR and TRS inputs. Just be aware that the two front ones override the rear inputs one and two. On the output side, you get 10 balanced TRS outputs, of which the first four are for the main and the second set of studio monitors. Then you also get old school MIDI in and outputs, which will make some of you happy. Two sets of TOS link in and outputs, which allow you to extend the 18i20 by a maximum of eight in and eight outputs, up to a sample rate of 96 kHz with ADAT. Besides these, you also get a set of SPDIF connections in the form of RCA and a word clock output to sync other devices. Of course, you also get a USB-C connection to hook up the interface to your PC and a power connector. Quick look inside, for conversion we can find really great chips. In the 4th gen 18i20, Focusrite went all in on Cirrus logic and we can see CS5381s for AD and CS43198s for DA conversion. I also like the attention to detail here with the preamp section being completely shielded, which should keep out any stray interference. Overall, I have to say the build quality of the 18i20 feels really nice and very much what you would like to expect in this price range. The housing is mostly out of metal, the LED meters look nice and the big encoder knobs make it easy to adjust settings. Now, do you want to know how to properly use your audio interface and record, mix and master your songs like a true professional? Then check out this video sponsor, Hofer College. Hofer College is an international online academy for audio engineering and music production. With the Hofer courses you get access to a lot of in-depth knowledge to grow your expertise in the audio field. In the Hofer online campus you can learn whenever and wherever you want and with the completion of the online courses you also get a corresponding certificate. With Hofer it's also possible to earn a diploma or bachelor's degree in audio engineering. I checked out their courses myself and I really like the inclusion of audio samples in the learning material to get a better understanding of a specific topic. Depending on your chosen course, you also get to work on audio projects, which you send to the Hofer College team and they will give you direct feedback on your assignment. 
Besides the courses, the Hofer College has lots of educational videos ranging from audio fundamentals all the way to advanced mastering techniques. The Hofer courses are available in German and English and Hofer was kind enough to provide me with a discount code for you to use with their courses. So if you're just getting started and want to dive deeper into the professional audio world or you want to pursue a career in audio engineering and music production, check out Hofer College with the links in the description. Okay, let's have a look at the mic inputs. With the maximum gain setting, pretty much all frequencies are recorded equally well. There's just a tiny bit of roll off in the very low frequencies, but I doubt that you will hear that. At a lower gain setting, the response is even flatter and that's close to perfect in the audible range. I promised you to show you the air mode and that's what you can see here. There are two flavors of air mode and that's presence and presence and drive. With presence you will get an upward sloping response which adds, well, a presence boost. I've turned on air mode now so you can hear the effect on the audio. The presence mode has some effect on distortion, but it is minimal, so most of the effects come from the boosted treble. Okay, now switch to the presence and drive mode and you should hear a clear difference. This mode has a classic V-shaped curve, which I'm personally not the biggest fan of and I've linked the video in the description which explains why, but you might like the sound of it. In addition to the drive, it also introduces distortion, which makes the audio sound a bit more gritty, so to say. If you want to give your audio a bit more bite or boost in presence, then these effects might be what you're looking for. Just make sure that you really like the effect, because after recording there is no way to remove them again in case you changed your mind. Dynamic range is up next and it is the ratio of the strongest signal that the interface can capture compared to its noise flow and you want this to be as high as possible to have minimal noise, especially with condenser mics. Here the ATI20 comes in at 115.6 dBA, which is excellent and pretty much more than you will ever need. Next, let's have a look, well, have a listen to the noise of the preamps as this is important for recording with dynamic microphones. I'm speaking into an SM7B right now and this is one of the worst mics in terms of signal strength and this brings out the noise of the preamps. Have a listen to the noise floor. That's a great noise performance with this worst case microphone and this is also confirmed by my measurements. While there are slightly better performers out there when it comes to noise performance, the difference is small and I have the suspicion that Focusrite had to leave a bit of performance on the table in order to make the preamps fully digitally controlled. Here's how the noise directly compares to a few other interfaces. In normal recording scenarios I don't think you will hear much difference to other interfaces in terms of noise and that also means that there is no need for a fat clouder or anything like that. The 18i20 4th gen also has more than enough gain to amplify pretty much all microphones to a proper level. Alright, for the audio scientists here I will just show a couple more graphs from the line inputs, but as the performance is very much the same as for the mic inputs I will just glance over them. Just one word here on the distortion level, with a strong line level signal close to clipping there is a noticeable rise in distortion. From a technical point of view I would have really liked to see a better performance here. Now normally you leave yourself some headroom and then this distortion doesn't even come into play, so it's fine. Could have been better though. Time to quickly look at the output side. The main outputs have a ruler flat frequency response. It doesn't get much better than that. Distortion is also really low, most certainly inaudible, which is exactly what I hope to see. And dynamic range is excellent with about 122 dB A weighted, meaning there is no chance that you will hear any noise from the main outputs. In my opinion, these outputs are transparent and that means that you will only hear the playback music without any noise or distortion. The headphone output is interesting again because this is where most manufacturers struggle a bit. For the most part, I have to say that the headphone output on the 18i20 is pretty good and actually an upgrade from the third generation, especially in terms of power and distortion. It's nice to see that the frequency response is very flat, but the output impedance with 11 ohm is a bit too high for my taste. This can start to negatively impact the sound quality of low impedance headphones. Granted, 11 ohm is still pretty low and likely just fine with most headphones, but I would not really recommend using very low impedance headphones like 24 ohm and below with the 18i20 if accuracy is important for you. Higher impedance headphones don't really have this issue and are just fine. Power wise the 18i20 can also drive most headphones to loud levels, but I would have hoped for a bit more juice, especially because the interface is directly connected to the mains. Distortion again is low enough to not worry about even with low impedance headphones and the noise performance is great. 
With over-ear headphones, you should not hear any noise. Just one more thing to mention is that the volume of the headphones is digitally controlled and that means that the left and right side of your headphones will always be equally loud, regardless of the volume setting. That's always nice to see. Overall, a solid headphone output performance. In this day and age, I would have hoped for a bit more technical perfection, but it's already very good. All right, let's have a look at the software. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, this plays an important role with the 8924th gen because you can control pretty much any function directly from the software without needing to harass your interface's hardware controls. This even includes things like gain setting, phantom power control, and output volume. And now you can also see the amount of input gain in dB, which was a feature I requested back when I had a look at the 2i2 4th gen. Thanks Focusrite for including that. For channel 1 and 2 you can switch them to instrument inputs and for all channels you have the option to toggle save mode and air mode which you could already see and hear in action. The save mode is quite interesting. What it does is essentially it listens for audio peaks which would otherwise clip your preamp and then instantly adjust the gain down so that the signal does not clip. This can be quite handy, although it works differently to a limiter in that it does not turn the gain back up again after the peak is over. So this does save your signal from clipping, but if there is a sudden spike, like for example from plugging in a microphone, then this could reduce the gain setting from what you had set before. That's why I think it's nice to have, but it is not as useful as a real limiter. In the mixer section, you guessed it, you will find multiple mixes. A to F, which you can send to your outputs and even each headphone output individually. This gives you a lot of flexibility to find what and where you want to hear it. Quick side note, the mixer is only available with sample rates up to 96 kHz. Above that it is disabled, the info message is really helpful here and when you click on it you get to change the sample rate. While we are in the preferences, here you can also control things like the clock source, talkback destination and also have an option for the interface to remember phantom power settings after a power cycle. That's always appreciated. One thing I noticed with the talkback is that it seems to only use the built-in microphone of the interface and as of making this video you cannot select any other mic input or even a USB mic on your PC, which you can for example do with most Audient interfaces. Maybe this is something that Focusrite can add in the future. And you won't believe what's in the routing tab. Right, routing options. Here you can control where to send your channels to, set up an alternative pair of studio monitors and also trim for each channel individually. And there's also loopback as well. Lastly, the software allows you to save your settings into presets, which makes it super easy to recall different mixing and routing setups. Enough about the software, let's have a quick look at latency before wrapping this up. Round trip latency is the time it takes the interface to record a signal and then play it back again. This is important when you want to process effects on your PC and monitor with them. Besides the air mode, the 8920 does not have any internal effects. All audio will need to be processed in the PC and this can be especially important when you want to use an amp sim and don't want to have any delay. With 48 kHz the performance is still good, although I have measured interfaces with faster times and that includes the third gen Scarlett interfaces. If latency is critical for you, you might want to try to disable safe mode in the driver to gain one millisecond at the increased risk of crackling audio. At higher sample rates, the times improve and are very good now. So again, if latency is critical, you might also want to try higher sample rates. All right, what's the verdict? I think the 8920 is a really nice interface with lots of IO and great software control. And that already brings me to the pros of this interface. First of all, pretty much everything is controllable via the software and you can go fully hands off with the interface and only need to touch it when plugging in stuff. It's also usable as a standalone interface and rack mountable. I also like the additional features you get like air mode and safe mode and auto gain, which can be especially handy when trying to set your gain quickly for multiple channels. The audio quality is also great and in many aspects transparent, meaning that you do not hear any noise or distortion from this interface. The 18024th gen is also extendable via ADAT, has talkback and the mixing and routing functionality makes this a prime candidate as a studio centerpiece. Things to consider are that there are no DC coupled outputs with the 18920, so if you need that for your synth, then something like an AudioFuse 16 rig might be more interesting for you. The 18920 also doesn't let you directly insert hardware effects into your signal chain, which is for example possible with the Audient ID48. And there are no EQ and compressor effects that are running directly on the interface, like for example with the Moto Ultralight Mark V. Besides that, I think it's a great interface that will cover most recording scenarios and especially if you like to control your interface via software from your PC, the 8924th gen might be exactly what you're looking for. 
please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe because the SSL 18 review will be up soon and you don't want to miss that. Alright, I will see you all in the next one.